It's very exciting for me to be on the stage to talk a little bit about the history, but also um, in the audience and watch Josh give this delivery. It's hard to tell, but Josh has only been in the position for about seven months, and while he was AAAF aware, uh, he was not an active participant. So uh, I think it would, for those of you who have been in the community and for those of you who would like to come into the community, just a note of recognition for Josh is our, our still relatively recent, but it's hard to show, uh, managing director. Um, so I am the uh, Associate University Librarian and the Chief Technology Strategist from um, Stanford University and uh, the founder of IIIF, so I have a lot of history, and most of that comes from the pain of an individual institution that needed interoperable solutions, and then the thrill of working with a tremendous number of tech, um, technically savvy and user savvy individuals and institutions to frame this um, environment. So what I'm gonna do is give a little bit of the background on some of the great developments that Josh just showed, but also some of the pain and some of the promise that we still see at Stanford as part of this. So. From Stanford's perspective, IIIF all started with parker.stanford.edu. Um, and if you're not familiar with this, it's a, a digital library site um, that is beautiful and was arguably best in class before we replaced it, and so now it's even better. Um, and then, as many of us who have built these sites know, it was, it was hard to build. Uh, the image delivery in particular was particularly challenging. This was around 2006, 2007. Um, and it turns out that we produced this wonderful site with all these technical challenges, and it was such a success that its users wanted more. They wanted to be able to export the images. They wanted to be able to annotate the images. They wanted to be able to run custom transcription software. They wanted to be able to compare the images with those of other sites. And what we realized um, is, or what we, what we put ourselves in the position is thinking about the WWMD, or what would a medievalist do? So we stopped and we thought, and we said, well, who else has the same problems that we have? Um, what collectively are we trying to do? What are the core scholarly use cases that we were trying to address with parker.stanford.edu? And what could we do with others who had similar content but the same overall sets of problems? And it turns out there were a number of fellow travelers at the same time, and many of these came out of the rich digital humanities tradition. Many of these, but not all of them, were funded with the help of the Mellon Foundation. Many of them were leading projects from uh, national libraries and universities. So uh, in about 2010, uh, we started to have a series of discussions with not just uh, representatives from Parker, but the Ramon de la Rose project from Johns Hopkins University, DIAM, um, which was an independent project of the time, but as images of uh, medieval manuscript, um, uh, musical manuscripts, the eCodices project from Switzerland, uh, Gallica from the Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, and Oxford. And we got together because each of them had built their own version of Parker and had tried to solve many of the same problems. And we realized that effectively we had built a set of silos. We were all doing the same thing, but we had all done it in very different ways. And uh, not by design, but just by the force of independent operation, we had built these separate stacks or these silos of both technology and content. And while we wanted to cooperate or co-op, um, essentially what we were doing is uh, setting up different technology stacks and content silos next to each other and forcing individual users to navigate the cr across the top um, as shown by that catwalk. So at one of these um, dinners, we said, hey, uh, there are a lot of promises around doing, um, so these meetings, we had uh, several people from those different projects coming to Stanford over the course of uh, about a year, a year and a half. And one night at dinner, um, we, sat down and we said, look, medieval manuscripts are very exciting and uh, they're unquestionably scholarly, they're rich and they're beautiful, but we all have way more content than just medieval manuscripts and maybe we're thinking about this at too small a scale. Can we expand out and let's think about all of the image-based content that we have, not only to our research institutions, but worldwide? So this is, we went to a Cuban restaurant. This is the apocryphal story, was true. Uh, we went to a Cuban restaurant, it's not a napkin, it was actually a paper tablecloth, and we started doodling on the tablecloth um, and tried to figure out what would it look like if we went to global scale. And about four months later, uh, IIIF was born. 
And so the idea, as Josh described and is, is quite right, is can we come up with a global framework for sharing all image-based resources in a way that's mutually useful or simpatico, uh, reducing the friction of sharing materials in a framework that includes not just APIs, but software content and community. Um, because again, while manuscripts are an uh, important part of our collections, it's only part of our collections. At the time, um, we had some very specific things that we were trying to do. Um, one is just deep zoom was technically hard. It's no longer as technically hard, in part because of the advances that IIIF had made. This is still, I think, the best example. This is from Princeton University Libraries, and they were an early implementer of Open Sea Dragon, uh, which has a lot of overlap. Um, we had very large images that we were struggling to deliver over the web. This is a gigapixel image, um, but this is now standard technology within our repository and for many other sites. Um, we wanted to compare images and compare images both from the same site and from different sites. This is a great example from the Yale Center for British Art and as part of their provenance and conservation history looking at uh, the origin of different types of, um, of portraiture. Stanford's also a relatively young institution, and what we realized is as many medieval manuscripts as we had, being founded in 1891, there were others that had many, many more. Um, and uh, this is an early example of some of the work that my colleague Ben Albritton, who's gonna speak later today about manuscripts are, but um, we basically found ourselves undoing the work that others had done uh, a century earlier. So Otto Ege is a biblioclast, um, which is a person who purposefully destroys or tears apart books. Why did he do that? He was a manuscript dealer, and he found he could make more money by disbanding manuscripts and selling the individual pieces, which is great for near-term profit, but harder for long-term scholarship. Um, ben, through his research, had found that while we held uh, many leaves of a particular um, uh, manuscript at Stanford, uh, he found through tracing the actual history and descriptive metadata in the community that other institutions in South, Southern California, California, North Carolina, and Mississippi held other pieces. And through the power of AAAF, was able to unite those things uh, virtually together while they were physically dispersed. So um, Josh described this as well, as this, this notion of the silos and the duplication, and that APIs enable reuse. So taking another look at this from a more uh, a practical or grounded uh, issue, is we found that we had use cases where uh, we had a single server and a single application, and we wanted to be able to deliver that content. So we could have drawn a straight line, or we could go through IIIF as a set of APIs. The advantage of going through a IIIF as a set of, set of APIs as is as in that last example, we could unite content from two different servers and present that in the same application for conjoined study. Or we could have a single server with uh, multiple different applications sitting on top. So in this case, we might want deep image delivery, but also the ability to annotate images in a different application that we hadn't developed ourselves. Or third, we might want to expose some of our content to external web services uh, for the automated uh, uh, description or uh, writing of bounding boxes to facilitate transcription. And what we had found effectively is that IIIF effectively separates out and uh, augments, uh, separates out the concerns of research institutions with repositories, of scholars, and of software developers who want to build a set of tools. Research institutions hold the materials but don't want to and shouldn't have to develop all of the software um, that, to expose their digital materials. Software developers are really good at developing tools but shouldn't be forced to write tools to a specific repository or a specific content type. And scholars really are less concerned about where the content is and what the software is. They want the best tools and the best content to pursue, pursue their research at any given time. And I think the fundamental advantage of IIIF and where I keep seeing the value is through this interoperability. And it's interoperability across many different vectors. So technology is the most obvious one, but it's also the ability to remix and reuse content um, and tools across different contexts, across different geographies, uh, across uh, physical space, across time, and across different types of users. So, that's why IIIF has been very exciting and meeting the distinct needs of an institution like Stanford in the past. One of the exciting things is what it may offer us going forward, and one of the things that we're increasingly interested in is leveraging IIIF with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So in a, in a crude rendering, um, what if instead of writing content from your repository, exposing content your, of your repository to applications, 
what if you could open it up to the wealth, the growing wealth of artificial intelligence services that are out on the open web, uh, both as to consume your content but also to enrich your content. And we think IIIF has a privileged position in this ecosystem uh, because uh, as a way to expose your content through a standard API uh, for large-scale consumption, but also as a way for these AI-enriching services to express the enrichments back in a standard model or a standard language that we can work into our environments. So basically annotations that we can reintegrate into our services. So some early work that we've done at Stanford is focused on um, extracting road networks and looking at the growth of road networks over time. So we basically came up with a computer, computer vision pipeline to identify road networks uh, over a series of years with road atlases for the same road networks in the United States. Um, and there's a whole separate presentation that you can look on that. The exciting thing is, is we found this core technology was not only useful for looking at road networks, uh, but for feature extraction from other types of items. So here is an example of looking at an, an initial from a medieval manuscript uh, with a folio. So identifying a, a uh, the key characteristics of that, basically doing some on-the-fly parameter setting to let the machine learning know how similar it should look. And on the fly, this is the same algorithm that was used for the um, extracting and finding similar road networks to find similar medieval initials. Um, this doesn't need to just be uh, restricted to cultural heritage and memory institution material. Um, these are uh, images of blood cells. Can I count the number of blood cells or find similar blood cells from stem imagery? Um, and then perhaps uh, more whimsically, but I think that it demonstrates the power, where is Waldo? Most of you are probably familiar. It turns out by training um, the machine with only five Waldos, uh, it's possible to run through and find similar Waldos. So think about the hundred million or billions, or I'm gonna go one up, tens of billions of materials that are available via IIIF. We can't actually count, so um, that we know it's over a billion. Um, think about all of the materials where we might wanna find similar items across our combined corpora. Um, this is very exciting to find all of the Waldos. So in sum, IIIF, from our perspective at Stanford and, I th and a historical perspective, is important for two things. One is interoperability reduces the friction of delivering and using in, uh, digital content on the web. So it's better, faster, uh, deeper, and cheaper delivery of your assets. You can plug and play different types of software, and you can publish content once and reuse it in ways that you had never imagined. Uh, at the same time, it's not just viewing images, it's really interacting with them. So whether that's uh, uh, deep zoom, panning and manipulating, whether it's mixing up materials from different collections, whether it's the ability to cite, to share, or to annotate, or it's the ability for some of these uh, up and coming machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms, uh, it really offers promise that would be far beyond the capabilities of any single institution to imagine. When we started this uh, by convening a set of meetings with people of shared concerns, no one in the room at that time could have imagined where IIIF would go today. So here are some, here are some uh, I think, pithy quotes. Uh, they are a little bit old, but still sum up where IIIF is. So Francisca Frey from Harvard uh, said in a meeting once, it's like going from the 18th century to the 21st century in a single click. Uh, Glenn Robeson, who's now the IIIF technology coordinator, um, but was at the National Library of Wales when he said this, is IIIF is good for the National Library of Wales, but it's also good for sharing content, one of the mandates for, for that institution. And Richard Higgins from Durham University said, IIIF doesn't just keep you out of silos, it keeps you out of dead ends by making sure that you're not developing a, a set of technologies that only you are going to use. So thank you, that's just a little bit of context, and we'll get into some showcases.